Hi, it's Katrina. Mysterious ice chip. In a shocking discovery from Antarctica, what appears to be a huge ship locked in an iceberg has been spotted in satellite images. The ship appears to be about 400 feet long, totally encased in ice 100 miles from the coast. Authorities don't yet know exactly where the ship came from or how it became trapped in ice, as there are no records of a ship this size going missing near Antarctica. The vessel is a total mystery, and all we can really do is guess at what happened here. The biggest clue is that the ship looks like a cruise liner. It also appears to be completely on its side. You can even see the rows of windows from the cabins all along the hull and the smokestacks on the top of the boat. One of the wilder theories is that the boat stuck in the iceberg was from a lost Nazi base built in Antarctica nearly a century ago. More realistically, this was a ghost ship that was abandoned at sea and floated down to Antarctica. Then it tipped over, froze, and became one with a huge sheet of ice. While that is one possibility, it's also potentially just one big hunk of ice that looks remarkably like a giant ship. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. The World's Longest Canyon Underneath the Greenland ice sheet, researchers have discovered evidence of the longest canyon ever. And yes, it's even longer than the world-famous Grand Canyon. The enormous gorge goes all the way from the highest point in central Greenland to the Peterman Glacier on the northwest coast. That's a distance of over 460 miles. But researchers believe the ravine in the canyon could be even longer, going further south, deep beneath the ice sheet where scientists can't see. If the ice wasn't here blocking the canyon, it would look almost identical to the huge chasm that's so famous in Arizona. It's 2,600 feet deep at some points and up to 6 miles wide. It also has distinctive V-shaped walls and a flat bottom. Researchers say this probably means the canyon was carved by flowing water. It's not the deepest canyon in the world, as that award still goes to the Mariana Trench at 35,827 feet. But it is the longest, even beating the 308-mile-long Yarlung Sengpo Grand Canyon in China. What makes this discovery especially interesting is the answers to questions that scientists have been asking for years. Everyone has always wondered what happens to water as it melts under Greenland's ice sheet. We know that it drains into the sea instead of pooling anywhere in the middle, but now we can see that the water is collecting at the bottom of a huge canyon and then being routed directly into the ocean. There is an entire underground river channel here, covered in a seriously thick layer of ice. Horse DNA About a decade ago, soil samples were taken from Canada's Klondike region in the Yukon, scooped out from under a thick layer of permafrost. But instead of any scientific analysis being done to the samples, they were just stuck in a Canadian freezer at McMaster University. It wasn't until just a few months ago that researchers took the frozen soil samples out to see what they could find inside of them. And what they discovered is quite frankly shocking. These icy soil samples reveal DNA from a species of woolly mammoth and from species of wild horses that have been extinct for thousands of years. If you're wondering how animal DNA was found in the soil, it's not the same DNA you're probably thinking of. It's called environmental DNA, composed of microscopic residue left behind by a variety of animals as they move through a particular environment. By picking apart the DNA samples, scientists were able to see that animals from the Ice Age lived a lot longer than we had ever imagined before going extinct. What really shocked researchers, and indeed scientists around the world, is that the DNA present in the samples came from just 5,000 years ago. That means the woolly mammoths and the Ice Age horses, the ancestors of North American horses, were still alive in Canada alongside humans. They lived for 8,000 years longer than scientists previously thought. Frozen Brazilian Yacht The Marsem film, which in English translates roughly to Endless Sea, is a Brazilian yacht that was frozen in a solid brick of ice. The ship broke apart in Maxwell Bay on April 7, 2012. How? The yacht, which belonged to the famed Brazilian journalist and entrepreneur Joao Mesquita, was manned by four crews who were filming a documentary off the Antarctic coast 
When the boat ultimately capsized after being pummeled with strong winds of over 40 knots, along with waves estimated to be nearly six feet tall. The researchers were forced to radio for help before they all froze to death. Luckily, there happened to be a Chilean Navy base in the area. They were rescued by the Navy, though there was nothing that could be done about the yacht. It sank, but it didn't get very far. The yacht only made it about 30 feet deep before the water froze, the vessel's hull split in half, and it became trapped in ice. It made for an eerie picture, trapped beneath the surface and still clearly visible from above. The yacht's owner waited 10 months until the ice thawed and an attempt to recover the boat could finally be made. Ultimately, the time spent under the ice and the hull damage was too great to be repaired. Even once they got the ship back onto the shore, it was completely broken and beyond fixing, destined only for the salvage yard. Dangerous Gases Rising temperatures in the Arctic are causing a change in the environment. In the black spruce forests found in central Alaska along the Tanana River, trees have been tipping over, toppling to the ground, and slowly being absorbed by a soupy bog. Where once the ground was hard-packed ice, today it's more of a sloppy swamp of rain and snowmelt. There is no denying that the world is steadily getting warmer and the permafrost in the north is thawing. One of the most horrendous things to come from all this melting permafrost is an increase in greenhouse gases. A recent study done by Alaska scientist Merit Turetsky and his team have found that under the ice there is a lot more gas than previously thought. They have confirmed in recent years that as the ice thaws, huge bursts of gas are gushing into the atmosphere. It's a process known as abrupt thaw, with gases being released from the ice contributing majorly to the very issue causing all this gas to be released in the first place. Still, all the gas being found under the ice doesn't have nearly as big of an impact as what people are doing by burning coal and creating other emissions. Thawing permafrost is, however, expected to amplify climate change caused by humans. According to a recent report by National Geographic, the effects will be amplified by about 20%, and all because of gas under the ice. Jewels on a French Glacier Back in 2013, a mountaineer was climbing Mont Blanc, the French glacier, when he came across a literal treasure. The treasure was stashed inside a metal box, which experts say was on board a plane from India that crashed into the mountain over 50 years earlier. The mountaineer couldn't believe his luck when he pried open the metal box and was staring at a treasure trove of emeralds, sapphires, and rubies. They were just sitting right there, the metal box half frozen in a chunk of glacier ice. In total, the treasure is worth an estimated $340,000. The mountaineer turned out to be a really good citizen as well. After he finished climbing the mountain, he handed the treasure over to the local authorities. He didn't want to steal somebody's precious gems. Additionally, if you find treasure in the mountains, French law says you have to give it to the police. And in the end, being a good citizen really paid off. Eight years after the discovery, local authorities finally agreed to split the profit from the gemstones with the climber. That's a total profit for him of $169,000. But you're probably wondering what the box of treasure had to do with the plane that crashed. In 1950 and in 1966, there were plane crashes on Mont Blanc, both of them Air India planes. Over the years, climbers have occasionally stumbled upon chunks of debris, human bodies, and pieces of luggage frozen in the ice. Authorities say the precious stones were probably from the flight in 1966 bound for New York. The crash killed 117 people, and one of them had apparently brought a whole hoard of jewels into America. What would you do if you found a box of jewels frozen in ice? Would you hand it over to the authorities or stash it away and hide it? Let me know in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe before you go. We have lots more videos coming up. Cold War Fossils Back during the Cold War, the U.S. was busy digging out a chunk of northwestern Greenland as part of Project Iceworm. It was in 1966, a covert mission to create a nuclear base beneath the Greenland ice sheet capable of striking the Soviet Union with nuclear warheads. The project was kept top secret until decades later and even still, it's hard to believe the U.S. tried something so unusual. Creating a subterranean ice base sounds more like the plot of a spy movie than an actual U.S. military project. 
But the mission was a failure. Project Iceworm was ultimately ended. Camp Century, the base itself, was abandoned. So too were ice core samples taken by scientists during the initial construction of the base. But the US didn't care about boring old ice cores back then, so the samples were stuffed in a freezer in Denmark and ignored for decades. Then, in 2019, a group of scientists finally investigated what the Cold War scientists had dug up, and it's really quite fascinating. The scientists found fragments of fossilized plants, life forms that bloomed millions of years ago. These plants prove that Greenland hasn't really been covered in ice for that long. Up until now, it was believed that Greenland had been covered in ice for 3 million years, but that couldn't possibly be the case. The fossilized plants show beyond a doubt that there was significant tundra-like climate on Greenland during that time, which wouldn't have been possible if the ice wasn't there. Scientists believe that at some point in the last 2.6 million years, Greenland lost its giant ice sheet, shifted to a tundra, and eventually regained its ice. Expedition Ship Frozen Solid In 2014, an Antarctic expedition ship became stranded in the ice. Members of the Australasian Antarctic Expedition on board the MV Academic Chocolaski got stuck for 10 days at Christmas, with absolutely no way out. They had to call in a Chinese icebreaker to come to their rescue, along with a reroute of an Australian icebreaker to help. They originally called a French icebreaker, but it had to retreat when it became clear that the ice was so thick that even it couldn't help out the ship. 52 members of the expedition were trapped until a helicopter team finally came to airlift the scientists and tourists to safety. When the ship got stuck, it was trying to make its way through clear water to a small cluster of rocky islands called the Hodgman Islands. But the clear water suddenly froze, the ice came out of nowhere, and they couldn't move. By Christmas Eve, the captain realized there was no way they could get to the open water just two nautical miles in front of them. The ice was thick and just kept accumulating. After a few more days, open water was no longer 2 nautical miles ahead, but 20 nautical miles. That's just how fast the ice builds up in Antarctica. With almost no warning, the ship was trapped in a rapidly growing iceberg. With international help, the ship was finally freed, but it was a very close call. Ultra Hot Super Ionic Ice Scientists have made a fascinating new discovery involving ice. They call the discovery ultra-hot super-ionic ice, and it appears to be a new and mysterious phase of water never seen before. Scientists created this new form of ice by squeezing a water droplet between a pair of diamonds and then blasting it with one of the most powerful lasers in the world. See? Science is fun! The super-ionic ice is actually water that exists at the same pressure and temperature as what can be found at the center of the Earth. Prior to this discovery, researchers had only managed to create superionic ice for 20 nanoseconds before it dissolved. They did this by using shock waves. But by squeezing a water droplet between the diamonds and then blasting it with the laser to temperatures found inside a star, they were able to make the ice stable enough to steady. This is now the 18th phase of ice to be discovered, and one of the weirdest. Its oxygen atoms lock into place just like they normally do when water freezes, but the hydrogen atoms give up their electrons and become ions, free-flowing as a fluid. What this means is that ultra-hot superionic ice is both a solid and a liquid at the same time. It's a cube of ice with flowing hydrogen atoms inside of it. Pretty incredible, huh? Would you ever think of blasting lasers at diamond-squeezed water droplets? Didn't think so. Mysteriously Draining Lakes NASA has discovered a mysterious system of draining lakes beneath the Antarctic ice. They found two new lakes of frigid water between 1.2 and 2.5 miles beneath the ice on the southernmost part of the continent. What's truly strange is that these subterranean lakes fill and drain repeatedly in a cycle that scientists say could influence how meltwater flows into the southern ocean. And of course, the flow of meltwater from the ice is what influences currents in the Southern Ocean, affecting temperatures across the world. The lakes are located at the very bottom of the ice sheet, where the ice touches the rocky part of the Antarctic continent. Scientists believe the lakes are formed as a result of pressure and friction, and maybe even geothermal heat from below. Whatever the case, 
Scientists only discovered the lakes because of NASA's IceSat satellite using lasers to measure elevations of the ice. As the lakes fill and then drain, the ice above rises and falls. This shows there is a lake system beneath, releasing water into the ocean. Just how much water? In January, scientists found that just one of these lakes, located beneath the Amory Ice Shelf in eastern Antarctica, flushed about 198 billion gallons into the ocean in just three days. And while this may sound kind of boring, it's actually a critical system that influences seasonal dips in temperature as cold air currents move around the world. Discovering why billions of gallons of horribly cold water are dumped into the ocean from under the ice is key in understanding how all the weather systems of our world are connected. Lost Patagonian City The city of the Caesars goes by several names, including the City of Patagonia and the Wandering City. According to legend, it was located in an Andean valley somewhere between Argentina and Chile. It was a wealthy city with an abundance of diamonds, gold, and silver. Legend goes that it was enchanted. People encountered the city of the Caesars seemingly out of nowhere, and that travelers passed through and simply forgot about it. Some tales state that those who found it would collect a fortune in treasure. But much like Atlantis, many experts consider the city of the Caesars to be a myth, and that this magical city never existed at all. Stories about the so-called city of Patagonia have been in circulation for at least 200 years, during which time European colonizers failed to find it. The indigenous people probably thought that was a good thing, and if it was real, perhaps like Machu Picchu, it remained a secret for hundreds of years until people just kind of forgot about it. In 1766, a Jesuit priest searched for the ancient metropolis starting in what is now the Keulat National Park in Chile's Aysén region, but he too was unsuccessful in his quest. One of the many descriptions indicates that the mysterious city was located between two mountains, somewhere in the Andes. One of the mountains is made of gold, and the other is made of diamonds. According to popular belief and legends, to this day, this city is surrounded by an impenetrable mist, keeping it hidden from those looking for it. And while some take the city's absence as a sign that it was never there to begin with, others think that its ruins might still be out there, just waiting to be discovered. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Florida's Lost City Deep in the Everglades in far western Broward County lie the remains of Florida's so-called Lost City. The three-acre property was once home to a large Seminole village that was ultimately abandoned. Somewhere between 30 and 40 Confederate soldiers sought refuge there at some point during the Civil War and were killed by the Seminoles. Legend also holds that the notorious mobster Al Capone made moonshine at the site during the 1930s, when Prohibition outlawed the manufacture of alcohol in the United States. Archaeologists and state wildlife officials have found an array of artifacts over the years, including a canoe and other items of Native American origin, as well as an iron kettle that was once used for distilling sugarcane into alcohol. Many of these items are hundreds or perhaps even thousands of years old, while others can be traced back to as recently as the early 20th century. This place was popular. Records show that Al Capone owned a nearby saloon, and he was reportedly the only known person in the region with a strong connection to organized crime at that time. Regardless of whether he was associated with the lost city, researchers do believe that it did once house a bootlegging operation. Everyone who went there came back with a story, in the words of Archives Director Patsy West, who spoke with the South Florida Sun Sentinel. She explained that the iron kettle may have been used by the Seminoles, the bootleggers, or maybe even both. There may be more history to the lost city that nobody knows about. For example, several different Native American groups may have used it over time, but there is not much left to see there today. The lost city is listed as an archaeological site in the Florida State Archives, but it's not marked on any maps, and it's overgrown with thick vegetation. In other words, you need to know what you're looking for in order to find it. Tim Gad Also known as Thamugadi, Tim Gad was a Roman city and military settlement in Algeria's Ares Mountains. Founded by the Emperor Trajan around 100 AD, this site was built at the convergence of six Roman roads. Long ago, it served as a thriving agricultural and commercial center. The settlement flourished for hundreds of years, 
peaking in the 3rd century with a population of around 15,000 residents. Timgad boasted over a dozen baths, an impressive library, and numerous other magnificent structures, including public buildings and the 20-foot-tall High Arch of Trajan. But the city's glory would eventually come to an end. Its wealth made it a prime target for invaders. Starting in 430 AD, attacks by the Vandals and other groups progressively weakened Timgad. It was never restored to its former glory, and residents deserted it for good during the 8th century. The sands of the Sahara Desert buried the site, protecting its architecture against the elements. When Scottish nobleman James Bruce rediscovered Timgad in 1765, they found the structures in remarkably preserved condition. They unearthed and then reburied the buildings. But because they were the first Europeans to come across the site in centuries, British society scoffed at the team's seemingly outrageous claims of what they'd found. Nearly a century later, in 1875, British consul Robert Playfair visited the ruins at Timgad and made his own observations, which he added to Bruce's records. The French excavated the site from 1881 to 1960, and it remains shockingly intact today, representing some of the best preserved ruins of the Roman world. It has colorful mosaics, and the streets are filled with visible ruts left behind by ancient traffic. Stabiae The famous ancient cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum were just two of several settlements that were buried in ash when Mount Vesuvius erupted in 79 AD. Ten years earlier, during what's known as the Social War, another ancient city that sat in the volcano's shadow was destroyed. It was known as Stabiae. According to the writings of Pliny the Elder, only a single farmhouse was left standing. Luxurious villas offering panoramic views were built on top of the ruins, but their use was short-lived. Just a decade later, Vesuvius erupted, entombing the upscale homes in volcanic debris. Archaeologists rediscovered Stabiae during the mid-18th century at around the same time they found Pompeii. They chose to focus on the latter and reburied Stabiae for safekeeping, perhaps with plans to return and investigate at a later point in time. But the site was once again forgotten. Nobody paid attention to it again until the 1950s, when a local high school principal went looking for it. He found Stabiae, and it quickly became apparent that the ancient city was far more important than experts originally thought. Dating as far back as the 7th century BC, it served as a bustling commercial center. Stabiae's population peaked centuries later in the 10 years leading up to the catastrophic eruption. So far, excavations have uncovered several magnificent villas, as well as beautiful frescoes, sculptures, and other breathtaking architectural features. The ancient city is just one example of an overlooked archaeological gem that experts are finally getting around to exploring. A Lost Kingdom of Ancient Turkey Some of the most exciting archaeological discoveries are made by ordinary people. Take, for example, a farmer in southern Turkey who stumbled upon a large, partially submerged stone in an irrigation canal on his property. Known as a steel, it contained mysterious inscriptions. He notified authorities of the find in 2019, several months later. Experts examined it and noticed that the stone's hieroglyphs are in Luwian, an Indo-European language native to Turkey. It was common in the region during the Bronze and Iron Ages. The steel told of an ancient civilization that may have defeated the Kingdom of Phrygia, which ended during the late 8th century BC under the rule of King Midas. Prior to the discovery, archaeologists had no idea that the kingdom even existed. Now, they believe that the site may have represented one of ancient Turkey's largest settlements throughout its existence, which lasted from the 9th to the 7th centuries BC. At its peak, the settlement occupied a 300-acre area. The steel's inscription seems to indicate that the message it bears came directly from the Law Society's ruler, King Hartapu. Researchers don't yet know what the civilization called itself. They are actively working to learn what they can by excavating what they believe was its capital. So far, they have found at least one other inscription that mentions King Hartapu, but the details about who he was and his significance as a leader remains kind of vague. Have you ever discovered something cool hidden or buried on your property? Let me know in the comments below! And now for number four, but first want to give a big thank you to Sean Aitchison and daughter Emily and Kalina Alton. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. 
Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already to join the Origins Explained family. Mississippian Settlements The Mississippians were a Native American group that once thrived throughout much of what is now the United States. Between roughly 800 and 1600 AD, they operated a vast, loosely interconnected trade network of urban settlements and satellite villages. It stretched as far west as the Rocky Mountains, all the way east to the Atlantic Ocean, north to the Great Lakes, and south to the Gulf of Mexico. Mississippian architecture varied by region, but many of these sites contained common features, including large earthen platform mounds. They were tied to a common culture and belief system that centered around ritual game playing. The Mississippians' way of life originated in the Mississippi River Valley. Their largest city and religious center, known as Cahokia, was located in modern-day southern Illinois. They had a complex social structure that led to a level of inequality that was not usually seen among Native American groups. The civilization peaked between 1200 and 1400 and then fell into decline. Many of Cahokia's residents fled amid increasing warfare and political turmoil. By the year 1500, most factions of Mississippian society had dispersed. Those that remained were in severe distress. By the time Europeans and Native Americans came into contact for the first time, very few settlements still existed. Several modern indigenous groups are thought to descend from the Mississippians, including the Alabama, Appalachie, Chickasaw, Choctaw, Natchez, Osage, and Seminole, just to name a few. But the physical remains of the culture are scarce, with just a handful of ruins remaining today. What's left of Cahokia represents one of the few surviving Mississippian settlements. During its heyday around 1050 AD, it was home to as many as 30,000 people. Trelech Stories have long claimed that a city called Trelech was once the largest medieval settlement in Wales, but it only existed in legend. That is, until 2005, when a tollbooth worker named Stuart Wilson used his life savings to buy a 4.6-acre plot of land where he thought it could be found. It took him 12 years of digging and hundreds of volunteers, as well as over six figures in additional costs beyond the price of the land. But Wilson finally hit pay dirt when he and his helpers uncovered the remains of eight 13th century buildings. They include a manor with a moat, a round stone tower, and several outbuildings, which once ran alongside the city's market. Trelech functioned as an iron production center for an influential family of normal lords known as the Declares, according to Wilson, who spoke with the BBC in 2016. At its height, the city was home to around 10,000 residents, making it rather sizable at the time, when London's population numbered around 40,000. Wilson also pointed out that Trelech expanded rapidly, growing from nothing to its peak within 25 years. Evidence indicates that the settlement was destroyed during a Welsh rebellion in 1296. It was rebuilt, but most of the buildings at the site appear to have fallen into ruin by the 15th century. Trelech was abandoned entirely by 1650, shortly after the English Civil War ended. The Guanche People In early 2020, a group of amateur archaeologists discovered the remains of 62 adults and 10 newborns on Gran Canaria in Spain's Canary Islands. Using a drone, they located the bodies in a difficult-to-access ravine, situated roughly 75 feet down a series of cliffs. Concerned that the site was at risk of being vandalized, they notified local authorities. Professional archaeologists confirmed the discovery, dating the bones back to sometime between the 8th and 10th centuries. The remains belonged to members of an aboriginal group called the Guanche culture. The team also found burial shrouds made from animal skins and vegetable fibers at the site. Researchers believe that the Guanche people migrated to the Canary Islands around 1000 BC and that they were ethnically and culturally absorbed by Spanish settlers who arrived during the 14th century. There are some 1,200 known archaeological sites on Gran Canaria alone, but this one is unique for containing infant remains. These and other findings suggest that the island's indigenous inhabitants were all buried in the same manner. But where did the Guanche people originally come from? A few years ago, DNA revealed that they migrated to the Canary Islands from North America, and evidence suggests that they lived a typical Stone Age hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Despite these findings, the Guanche culture remains largely a mystery. It appears as though they lived in caves and got by with very few tools, 
and experts believe that they may have had some basic knowledge of farming and pottery. They also suspect that the Guanche built several pyramids throughout the island of Tenerife, but this has yet to be proven. Ayaz Kala The Ayaz Kala archaeological site in northern Uzbekistan is home to three Kalas, or mountain fortresses, which represent some of the last known remnants of the Khwarezm Shah dynasty. This lost civilization existed from the 4th century BC to the 7th century AD and flourished for roughly 1,000 years before it was abandoned. Located at the edge of the Kizilkum Desert near the Amu Darya River, the Kalas at Ayaz Kala were the dynasty's most remote and rugged structures. Each fortress is unique. There are no signs of any permanent homes near the first Kala, indicating that the site may have been used for housing military members in temporary dwellings, such as reed huts or tents. Ayaz Kala II is a feudal fortress dating back between the 6th and 8th centuries, and Ayaz Kala III was a fortified garrison that was used during the 1st and 2nd centuries. Very little is known about the mysterious culture that built the Kalas, which were abandoned during the 7th century and may have been briefly re-inhabited by another group during the 13th century. Bulgarian Brides In a collection of graves dug up in Bavaria, Germany, scientists discovered several elongated skulls, believed to be those of people who moved into the area from very far away. The skulls were unearthed in graves found in what were mostly Bavarian farming hamlets. These small communities were predominantly populated by people with blue eyes, blonde hair, and pale skin. Yet DNA analysis of the elongated skulls shows that a small number, probably no more than a dozen, were of women with dark hair, dark eyes, and much darker skin. It's believed these foreigners, whose skulls were significantly longer than the locals, were treaty brides from what is now Romania and Bulgaria. The chieftain leaders may have handed over the women with elongated skulls to marry the leaders of the Bavarian communities in order to improve political alliances. The skulls date back to about 500 AD, and they are not the only ones that have been found from medieval Europe and Asia. The big difference with these particular elongated skulls is that they were discovered alongside regular skulls throughout six southern German towns. Until recently, their identities, or why their skulls were formed in this way, was unknown. Ever since the first of these skulls was found in the 1960s, it's been a total mystery. It was the geneticist Joachim Berger who set out to sequence their DNA and get some answers. To get the information, the scientists looked at DNA from people in the graves with normal skulls and the people with elongated skulls. The genetics were wildly different. The researchers hypothesized that the women must have been shipped to Germany as wives. Since there were no men found with elongated skulls and no locals practiced cranial deformation, it's the only explanation scientists can think of that makes sense. Paraca Skulls In the 1920s, a Peruvian archaeologist named Julio Tello found hundreds of skulls in the Paracas region of Peru that were described as being shaped like cones. At first glance, people thought these skulls belonged to ancient aliens buried hundreds of years ago. It's an understandable assumption. After all, the eye sockets are so big that it just didn't seem that they could have been human. And coupled with the unusual shape of the skull, it's not hard to see why people reacted like this. But in fact, the remains are human. The eye sockets are not proof of alien life, but are rather perfectly ordinary, if not a bit distorted because of the unusually long skull. Melissa S. Murphy, a professor in anthropology at the University of Wyoming, says it's all just due to cranial deformation. During the first few years of life, the peoples whose remains yielded this unusual skull shape would have had bindings wrapped around their skulls to alter their growth. These bindings could be cloth, bands, or even hard pieces of wood. This cranial deformation practice allowed their heads to grow to be extremely long, making them look like aliens. According to Murphy, pre-Hispanic people along the south coast of Peru engaged in the practice for thousands of years. It was no different to them than getting tattoos or body piercings. And as for the unusually small skeletons that have been found with elongated skulls and massive eye sockets in Paracas, these too were just ordinary people. The eye sockets only look exceptionally big because of how large the head is. If the skull wasn't so elongated, the eye sockets wouldn't look quite so out of the ordinary. Would you change the shape of your skull if you could? Do you think the process was painful? Let me know in the comments below. The Atacama Alien Skeleton 
The Atacama alien skeleton is by far the most bizarre example of an elongated skull that's ever been found. It's also one of the strangest skeletons ever recovered by scientists. The reason it is so strange is that the skeleton appears to be the mummified remains of a humanoid creature no more than six inches long. And yet, despite being so small, it has a head nearly the size of its torso. It was discovered in the middle of the Atacama Desert, in the remains of an abandoned mining town. After its discovery, the world went wild. Everyone assumed it was a tiny alien that got stranded on Earth thousands of years ago. The skeleton was so impressive that a private collector in Spain paid a small fortune just to have it shipped to him. But here's the truth. The Atacama alien isn't an alien at all. Instead, these remains indicate not proof of an alien life form presence on Earth, but a tragedy. Scientists in California extracted DNA from the bones of the mummy to solve the case once and for all. Rather than being a visitor from another world, the skeleton was from a little girl. DNA has proven the skeleton did in fact belong to a human, a girl who was either stillborn or who died immediately after birth. The reason for her death is the same reason for her extraordinarily tiny skeleton. She suffered from several different conditions that gave her such a tiny body, such as congenital diaphragmatic hernia. What started as a conspiracy theory about aliens turned into a very tragic story about a woman who gave birth to a malformed infant. The genetic tests revealed the truth of the matter and settled the theories about alien life forms in this case once and for all. Pointy Skulls in Croatia A new study is looking for a correlation between artificial cranial deformation and migration after the fall of the Great Roman Empire. Scientists believe skull modification, people using different methods to shape their skulls into a point, may have been a rather extreme way to show one's identity to the outside world from between the years 300 and 700. This was during the time when groups like the Goths and the Huns were squabbling for territory in the ruins of the Roman Empire. In eastern Croatia, at a site called Hermanov Vinograd, archaeologists discovered a burial pit with the corpses of three teenage boys. The teens died sometime between 415 and 560. Two of them had deformed skulls. According to National Geographic, a DNA analysis revealed that all three of the boys had vastly different genetic backgrounds. The one that didn't have an elongated skull came from Western Eurasia. The boy with the moderately elongated skull came from the Near East. And finally, the boy with an extremely elongated skull descended from East Asia, probably Japan or Korea. The lead author of the study, Mario Novak, says the DNA results were a huge surprise. He also says it goes to show that people from all over the world were migrating into this part of Europe, interacting with one another, and even using elongated skulls as a visual indicator to show which cultural group they belong to. The Mangbetu people Elongated skulls sound like something that happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago. The truth is that the practice of cranial deformation was happening until very recently, in what is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The Mangbetu people of Central Africa have a distinctive look because their heads are shaped like cones. These people are living proof that the skulls found in Mexico, China, Europe, and elsewhere never belong to aliens, but just people who practice this particular custom. To the Mangbetu people, it was part of their cultural identity. Beginning just after birth, they would wrap the head of a baby tightly in cloth. The procedure continued for years until the infant's head grew into the desired shape. Either that, or until something went fatally wrong. How long has this been happening here? The answer is centuries. Skull elongation was a status symbol among the ruling class. The most beautiful, the most majestic, and the most powerful all had elongated skulls. The practice didn't begin to die out until the 1950s, when the Europeans arrived. The Belgians took over the Congo, and the practice was viewed as barbaric, so the government outlawed skull elongation. It's shout out time! Big thank you to Molly Perkins and family! Hi guys! If you are new here, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already because we have lots more videos about amazing and mysterious discoveries coming soon. Ancient Chinese Skull Reshaping Human skeletons found at the Hutamuga archaeological site in North China show some of the oldest examples ever of the intentional reshaping of a baby skull. Archaeologists uncovered 11 modified skulls along with 14 skeletons that had no modifications in an ancient graveyard. The 11 skulls had artificially elongated brain cases, along with flat bones at the front and back of the head. 
What this means is that people were compressing the skulls of infants either by tying their hands to the front and back of their head, wrapping their skulls in boards, or compressing them with cloth. Whatever they did, the result was the same. Out of the 11 skeletons, four belonged to adult men, one belonged to an adult woman, and six were from children. The ages spanned between 3 and 40. But what makes the discovery so unique, especially when compared to the rest of the other skulls I told you about, is that some of the oldest skulls were found here in sediment from 12,000 years ago. This proves without a doubt that cranial deformation has been going on perhaps since the dawn of humanity. Deformed Skulls in Hungary The largest graveyard filled with deformed human skulls happens to be in Hungary. It was here from between the 1960s and 1990s that archaeologists found the skeletal remains of about 96 people who lived during the 5th century. 51 of these individuals had artificially elongated skulls. That makes the ancient cemetery the biggest burial ground ever found in Central Europe in relation to how many altered skulls were inside of it. What's even more fascinating is that the graveyard contains bones that span across three generations showcasing three distinctive groups of people. The first people buried here were definitely Romans. They were found with their graves lined by brick, put together quite neatly. The second group of people came several years after, but were not Roman at all. These were the people with their skulls modified to be extremely long. It looks like what happened was that after the Romans fell in the early part of the 5th century, people the Romans had viewed as barbarians came into their cities invaded their graveyards, and buried their own dead on top of the Romans. The Elite Coyagua A new study of over 210 skulls from a pre-Inca society in Peru has led scientists to speculate that cranial deformation may have developed slowly over time. They have also learned that 600 years ago in South America, the most elite members of society had artificially elongated heads shaped like teardrops. This is about 300 years before the Inca arrived in 1450. The prominent members of the Coyagua civilization focused on having a more stretched out kind of look. Bioarchaeologist Matthew Velasco from Cornell University says the very fact that the high-ranking population had long and narrow skulls may have led to a relatively peaceful absorption into the Inca Empire when that day finally came. Because of the uniform head shapes, this could have encouraged a collective identity among the elites of the Coyagua. This may have helped the leaders to negotiate coexistence with the Inca rather than trying to fight against them. Of course, we don't know exactly what happened between these two powerful empires, but we know that the Coyagua survived beyond meeting the Inca. Spanish wrote about encountering them when they arrived in the 1500s, describing the Coyagua as having tall, thin heads. Skulls at the Hal Safliani Hypogeum the elongated heads discovered at the Hal Safliani Hypogeum are a huge mystery. For those who don't know, this place is in Malta, and it is the oldest underground temple and necropolis anywhere on the planet. It dates back to at least 3000 BC, or about 5000 years ago. And believe it or not, a group of elongated skulls were also discovered inside the temple, dating back to around 3000 BC. They were first discovered in 1902, and by the 1920s, National Geographic had reported that the first inhabitants of Malta were a bunch of people with elongated skulls. National Geographic compared the people of Malta to the ancient Egyptians, saying they may have even been Egyptians, who spread along the northern coast of Africa and settled in Malta and Sicily. But they didn't say anything about cranial deformation. They just assumed this was a race of people with really pointy skulls, they called them long-headed. Of course, we now know there has never been a race of people with unusually long skulls. They must have been practicing cranial deformation, but they were doing it a long time ago, before most other parts of Europe. Sarmatian Skulls In Crimea, the skeletons of five individuals with elongated skulls have been dug up, sparking crazy online rumors of an alien grave. But of course, the skeletons are entirely human. They date to about 2,000 years ago, meaning they were probably remains from Sarmatian culture. The Sarmatians used cranial deformation a little differently than other parts of the world. Reshaping the skull to be long and narrow in the back was considered a must-have feature for women. According to Nikolai Sudarev from the Archaeology Institute of the Russian Academy of Sciences, 
Women who had their skulls modified were considered more beautiful than those who didn't. But it also played an important role for men. Warriors were considered more fearsome if they had their skulls modified and extended. Perhaps the weirdest part about this discovery is that all five of the skeletons were found inside the same narrow grave. On the very top was a woman with a baby on her chest, and then three more skeletons underneath them. It's impossible to say what could have happened here, if they were victims of conflict or disease. Either way, it goes to show just how popular this modification was for the Sarmatians in Crimea. They almost all had their skulls elongated to look either more beautiful or more aggressive. A Portuguese Monster In Portugal, someone seems to have captured what appears to be a terrible monster on video. The beast can be seen in a short clip, just a few seconds long, skulking around in the desert before hiding behind a bush and vanishing. The monster looks oddly human, except that it has long and lanky limbs and doesn't seem to be the right color. Its skin is all pink and scabby looking. It could be a chupacabra, as some have speculated. Though historically, the chupacabra has been reportedly spotted in Texas, Mexico, Florida, and Puerto Rico. Until this footage, there have been no known reports of chupacabras roaming around in Portugal. While it is uncertain if the beast in the clip is the goat sucker monster known for drinking the blood of livestock, if not a chupacabra, some have suggested it could be a type of desert Bigfoot or Sasquatch. To be honest, if the creature is a Sasquatch, it looks to have suffered a serious sunburn. There is just something about the creature in the clip that doesn't look right. Sadly, no one knows what this thing is. All we know is that video footage of this mysterious monster has spread across the internet and is on dozens and dozens of websites, accompanied by plenty of bizarre theories. While it may be a hoax, all we can do is speculate. What does the creature look like to you? Let me know in the comments below. The Loch Ness Monster's Cousin If you've never heard of the Morag Monster, you're seriously missing out. This beast is the smaller, lesser-known cousin of the Loch Ness Monster and is every bit as mysterious as its larger, well-known brethren. It lives just a few miles away from Loch Ness in Loch Morar, the deepest freshwater body of water anywhere in Britain. It's in the Lochaber area of the Highlands, about as rural in Scotland as you can possibly get. There are some pretty big differences between the cousins, Nessie and the Morag monster. According to folklore expert Alexander Carmichael, the Morag monster has been spotted in a lot of different forms. Some people have seen the monster as a type of mermaid with flowing hair, while others have seen more of a grim reaper figure. Either way, the Morag monster isn't exactly a giant reptile like its friend over in Loch Ness. It's instead a harbinger of doom as it's almost always seen just before someone dies or drowns. The biggest major sighting was in 1898 when Aeneas MacDonald died and a large group of witnesses saw the monster appear from the loch in a black heap like a big, slimy, waterlogged monster without a face. Some have seen the beast as half human and half fish, but it's evil in every single case. Maybe the fact that it's such a terrible thing has made people a little more skeptical of searching for it than they are searching for Nessie, who's got an almost charming reputation in comparison. The Moon-Eyed People The Moon-Eyed People, as strange as it sounds, were supposedly a race of very small woodland people who live near what is now Murphy, North Carolina. These people had pale skin, bearded faces, very blue eyes, and they only came out at night. It's hard to say if they were humans or creatures, but the Cherokees swear they were real, living in the Appalachian Mountains. In fact, some even say that the Moon-Eyed People are still around today, though they've gone underground and are very rarely seen. There are all kinds of stories about the Cherokee interacting with the Moon-Eyed People, including a fight that took place in Tennessee that pushed them further north into West Virginia. And while it's easy to dismiss this as nothing but another legend, there could be some real truth to it. The Cherokee very well may have witnessed the Moon-Eyed People. Though they may not have been monsters, they may have simply been a group of white settlers from Europe who made it to North America before anyone else. The Cherokee may have seen their white skin and blue eyes and mistaken them for a race of human-like monsters. And yes, there is actually proof of this. A 16th century manuscript written by a Welshman named Humphrey Lloyd spoke of an Atlantic sailing in the year 1171. 
A Welshman named Prince Maddock may have actually landed in what is now Alabama. The manuscript from the 16th century says that the prince and his crew ventured up a river, what would have been the Alabama River, and were never seen again. It was around the same time that the Cherokee began witnessing moon-eyed people, what they thought were bizarre, otherworldly monsters. But really, they may have just been Welshmen. What do you think? Were the Cherokee legends based on early interactions with light-eyed Europeans? Let me know in the comments below. Petroglyph Sea Monsters In the Canadian province of Nova Scotia, a group of Native Americans known as the Mi'kmaq carved petroglyphs on the sides of rocks hundreds of years ago. These petroglyphs show what appear to be sea serpents. These monsters have no fins, no limbs, and they are much larger than a canoe. Zoologist Andrew Hebda says the petroglyphs were made to record the first sightings of sea monsters in Nova Scotia. Whether you believe it or not, there is no arguing that people have been witnessing serpent-like beasts in the waters around this Atlantic province for the last several hundred years. Even as recently as 2003, Lobster fisherman Wallace Cartwright said in a radio interview that he witnessed a sea serpent while checking his traps near the Point Oconee Lighthouse. At first, he thought there was a really big log floating across the water, but then he realized the log had a head attached to it and that the head was coming out of the water. He estimated the creature to be at least 24 feet long, its head like that of a sea turtle, but its body like a giant snake. He estimated its girth as being about the size of a five-gallon bucket. Nobody knows exactly what this creature could be, but it seems possible that it is a very real sea serpent that lives off the coast of Nova Scotia. The people who live in the region, as far back as the indigenous natives, have been seeing it for centuries, and sightings are still coming in today. Arizona Bigfoot Arizona has its very own version of Bigfoot, and it's called the Mogollon Monster. Sightings of the monster have been reported in Arizona as far back as 1903. An article from the early 1900s in the Arizona Republican spoke of a sighting near the Grand Canyon in which someone witnessed the cryptid, a huge beast that looked like a mix between a man and a monkey roaming through the desert. There have been plenty of sightings of the monster through the years. They all agree on a few specifics. They describe the creature as at least seven feet tall has bright red eyes, and it's covered in either long black or black reddish hair. One of the weirdest features of Arizona's Bigfoot is that it seems to give off a strong and very terrible odor. People who have gotten too close to the thing say it stinks like dead fish, like the musk of a snapping turtle, and like a skunk with a particularly intense smell. People also say the Mogollon monster is nocturnal, and that it can turn violent when provoked and it makes strange whistling sounds to freak out people camping at night. But despite all the reports, all the sightings, and all the extremely detailed descriptions, no one has ever obtained physical proof of the monster's existence, or even managed to snap a photograph of it. Do you think the Arizona Bigfoot exists? Could it be related to the Sasquatch? Let me know your thoughts in the comments! And now for number five, but first want to give a big shout out to Mecca Ortiz and NV. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like these. Number five, Panama Beach Monster. If you've been paying attention to the bizarre monster sightings of 2021, you've probably seen the weird creature that washed up on a beach in Panama. The video of the creature surfaced in September of 2021 getting over 25 million views immediately. The video has circulated on social media, with everyone trying to figure out what the weird creature was. Some people guessed it could have been a mermaid, an alien, or an unknown creature from the depths of the ocean that somehow ended up washed up on the shore. All these months later, it looks like we finally discovered the truth behind the speculation as to what exactly this odd creature found and filmed on the beach really was. Dr. Jessica Mayhew, a specialist in primate behavior at Central Washington University, says she knows exactly what the Panama monster was. She claims it was nothing but a howler monkey. A highly decomposed howler monkey, but a monkey nonetheless. She noted its thick neck, its high external ears, the shape of its head, and even its opposable toes. She even figured out the monkey was probably a male because of its large canine teeth. The reason it looked like such a horrible monster was just because of its decomposing tissue. 
This happens when any dead land animal is submerged in water for too long. Do you think the dead howler monkey looked like some kind of sea monster? Or did you realize right away what it was? Let me know in the comments below. Dogman Sightings of Dogman go back centuries in Pennsylvania. Dogman has been described as a werewolf-type creature that walks on its hind legs. It's as tall as a man, but has the head of a wolf. What's really interesting about this mysterious monster is that it's said to be significantly more aggressive than other creatures like it, meaning cryptids like Bigfoot and the Sasquatch. It's also normally spotted near freshly killed animals such as deer and rabbits. Any human that gets near it or its victim ends up being run off by the growling, snarling wolf monster. But just how much truth is there to these sightings? It's honestly quite hard to say. We know that modern reports of Dogman sightings go back as far as 1794. Excerpts from the journal of a French fur trader described witnessing what they called loup garou, French for werewolf, and in the legends of the Algonquin, they too speak of similar creatures living throughout Pennsylvania and Michigan. There is no doubt that people believe they have seen something that looks like a wolf-human hybrid in these parts, but in reality, they were probably just coming face to face with the largest wolves they had ever seen. If you had just come from France and had never seen a huge North American wolf before, alone in the woods in a strange new place, you might think it was a werewolf too. Flathead Lake Monster People have been spotting the Flathead Lake Monster for at least 129 years. What is it? A creature that is said to lurk beneath the waters of Flathead Lake in northwestern Montana. Unsurprisingly, it looks a lot like other lake monsters, a giant serpent that occasionally slips its huge head out of the water before going back under and vanishing. Most Montana natives have heard of the creature before, but only a few have actually had experiences with it. One of these people is local fisherman Keenan Applehands. He claims he witnessed a massive serpent on his fish finder, but wasn't actually able to see it with his own eyes. Then there's Lainey Hansel, a former biologist with Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. He started recording sightings in 1993 and continued to keep track for 30 years. But what's really bizarre is that he worked on the lake day and night for three decades and never actually saw the thing himself. Yet he logged dozens of sightings from tourists and fishermen alike who claimed they saw the monster. The reports vary on how big this thing is. Some say 30 feet, some say 40. Most agree it has steely black eyes and undulates under the water like a massive anaconda. The first sighting was allegedly in 1889 when a steamboat full of passengers saw the serpent slithering through the water. And since then, there have been at least 109 relatively reliable documented sightings. Organism 46B Organism 46B allegedly attacked a Russian scientific team near their Antarctic outpost of Vostok Station. But before we go any further, keep in mind that some say the story you're about to hear was completely made up because no evidence of it has ever been uncovered. The story actually only comes from a few vague sources, which means it either happened and was covered up, or it was just created as a piece of fiction. In any case, Organism 46B was allegedly encountered by Russian scientists in February of 2012, after three decades of drilling through the ice at Vostok Station. When they finally broke through the ice using modern technology, the creature, described as an enormous octopus, attacked. It shot venomous ink at them, strangled them with its tentacles, and killed several scientists before the crew was able to get the beast locked in a tank. The surviving members of the team then brought the monster to the surface, where Russian officials seized it and covered the story up. The Russian government denies that any such incident ever occurred, naturally. And today we have no idea what happened to the organism. We don't even know if it ever truly existed. What do you think? Do you think this giant octopus was real or it was covered up by Russian officials? Maybe fiction? Let me know in the comments below. Nessie in 4K. The Loch Ness Monster has been spotted yet again, this time in 4K high definition video. A man named Richard Mavor spotted the monster this time, though it was a total accident. Richard didn't even realize the great Scottish beast was in his footage until he uploaded the video onto his YouTube channel. It was his viewers that pointed it out. Halfway through his drone footage of the loch, Nessie can be seen swimming just beside the beach. 
And to be quite honest, there is really no mistaking the shape of the monster. It appears just as Nessie has been described numerous times over. Sadly, the creature is only in the footage for a few seconds before it goes back underwater. And even though this seems to be a legit recording, it's still not definitive proof that the Loch Ness Monster really exists. The first sighting of Nessie in modern days was 80 years ago, in 1933. Since then, there have been over 1,000 recorded sightings. This is the first major one done in 4K. And with a drone! What's your favorite monster or mysterious creature sighting story? Let me know in the comments below. And thanks for watching! Remember to subscribe and come back soon for more amazing videos. See you next time. Bye!